X-ray Systems Organization in Commercial Avionics. The uh, paper I'm going to talk to you about today grew out of my work on the cabin management system for the 777, and in the requirements development area, we were being asked by the people doing the detailed design work, well, what do you want us to do if uh, this particular condition happens, and uh, what do you want us to do if this other particular condition happens? And what I found was, in the requirements, I was continually chasing the design. And I asked myself, is there a way that I can get ahead of the design in the area of dealing with anomalous or what-if conditions? And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Most of the time, our requirements analyses proceed, we'd like them to proceed in linear fashion from the mission, the requirements, to the detailed design. What often happens is we end up having recursion because we forgot about certain conditions that are only discovered by the time you get to the detailed design area. And what that means is you end up with rework, which adds to expense, and even though requirements development may be completely traced from the source requirements, you can still uncover conditions that have to be addressed in the requirements, and if they're only discovered in the detailed design area, that's expensive rework. So the model I'm going to talk to you about today tries to address that problem. By the time you leave here today, I would like you to be able to do the following things. Be able to assess a requirements analysis as to its completeness in terms of anomalous conditions, what if conditions. Be, a, be able to derive a minimum set of requirement antecedents, the conditions for the requirement, based on a definition of system modes and states and to be able to apply the methodology to any requirements work you're doing right now. These are the topics we'll be going over. I've gone through the objectives. we we'll get into the motivation a little bit more. Look at a description of different kinds of requirements. Describe the model. Analyze different antecedents and go through in some detail an example so you understand exactly what it is I'm talking about. And for the folks who are involved in software, I want to touch a little bit on formal methods and the relationship between that and automation. First of all, some definitions. When I use the word antecedent, I do mean the conditional element in a proposition, as in if, or a preceding event, condition, or cause. And that's what we typically work from in requirements. When you have a certain condition experienced by whatever it is you're analyzing, then do the following things. And we call that the antecedent. An anomaly is defined as a departure from a normal form, rule, or order. And anomaly handling is the treatment of those anomalies in the system requirements analysis. And if you don't do this, you may get either indeterminate behavior or incorrect system behavior. In indeterminate because you don't know what's going to happen, which is the basis for designers coming and saying, well, what do you want to happen? Or the test people saying, I don't like that it does this, and I think that's wrong that it does that. And the option of what should happen never got defined early enough in the program. Or you may have incorrect behavior, which means someone at some level has implemented the wrong system. And it may be simply that the customer doesn't like what he got, but he never really spelled out very clearly. And I believe that a good system requirements analysis and the design should be neither incomplete nor incorrect. There's two ways you can look at the treatment of anomalies. You can say, well, we're going to allocate anomaly handling to Joe Smith, and he's going to take anomaly handling and, and deal with it for the whole system design. And when he's all done handling anomalies, he'll come back and tell us what the answers are. 
And that's where you basically can't describe it as a equivalent top level function. You do all the things you really care about up along this line and you have everything else goes in this bucket. Another way to look at it is function by function, you say, well, what if I don't have things going right? Do I want to modify the behavior of the system as a companion to the function I already defined? When you look at the definition of what an anomaly is, that it's a departure from the normal, the normal form, rule, or order, it's evident that you have to define what's normal before you can define the anomaly, and therefore you have to analyze anomalies on this level, function by function. And by the way, if you have questions regarding you don't understand something I'm saying, please feel free to ask. If you'd like to get into a detailed discussion, please pull that toward the end. Okay, here's the model. This may take you back a few years. It took me back a few years, Venn diagrams and a little bit of uh, set theory. Basically, we try to define sets of all possible conditions that a system may experience and categorize and define the resultant behaviors. Very simply, we have an antecedent A. The complement to that is, by definition, not A. That means all the things in the universe that are not in the, in the set A are part of the set, not A. But we have to define behaviors for both A and for the set, not A. If you have more conditions that you're really concerned about, say, for example, you have a set A, but you choose to break up not A into additional detailed sets, then you need to write behaviors for each of those details, each of the detailed conditions, and at least one of those sets, in this case D, must be the complement of the union of everything else you've already defined. Okay? The complement of the union of the conditions you've already defined. And you'll hear that phrase many times, and that's the key to what we're doing here. From this, I conclude, and this is the basis of the model, no functional requirement with an antecedent A is considered complete unless there also exists one or more functional requirements whose union is antecedent not A, such that A union not A is the universal set, which is the, unit, the set of all possible antecedents. In a nutshell, this is, this is what the model says, that in your requirements, for every condition, you must have also defined in the requirements one or more antecedents whose union is not A, such that A union not A is U. And therefore, then you know that you've covered all possible conditions for what the system may experience. And then with each of those sets of conditions, you have a prescribed behavior in the requirements. Now you notice I, I called this a, a completeness test because evaluating all the complementary antecedents is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient for completeness of the requirements. Other completeness criteria would be obviously that you allocated all of your top level requirements, those that were handed to you as an input to the activity. That's another completeness test. So this joins that completeness test to something to be done. When you're all done and you believe you're finished, go back and check it with this. Now it's very easy to prove that my assertion is correct to show that defining A and not A is necessary for completeness because suppose that there exists an antecedent Q which we haven't previously defined. Well because of the definition of A and not A, that they are complements and they the union of them is the universal set, Q by definition has to belong to either of those two sets. So if it turns out that in your definition of Q, it, you couldn't put it in either bucket, that means your definition of A or not A was incomplete. And therefore, Q by definition has to reside in one of these, so therefore the completeness test stands. If you treat not A, that ensures that all the possible what-if conditions are explicitly treated in the system requirements analysis. In other words, one cannot come up with any additional what-if conditions 
that the system may experience because you've already captured it in either the set A or in the set not A. It also turns out that when you analyze all these conditions, you're really doing a superset of the failure mode and effects analysis, which is near and dear to some of our hearts, where you ask the question, what happens if something fails? We don't get into the question specifically of cause, we just try to deal with the condition of not A, hey, something's not working the way we anticipated. And I found you can also use this technique to define the system states to ensure that your system behavior is always allocated to exactly one state from which you can get your minimum set of antecedents. So let me talk a little bit about system states for a moment. Those of you who work in software deal with this all the time. Okay, the number of states a system has determines the number of state-to-state -state transitions and therefore the number of minimum number of antecedents to be analyzed. Because at a minimum, every state is a unique antecedent. There may be more antecedents derivable in that state, but in, as a minimum, your requirements analysis has to have at least one antecedent associated with each state. And to ensure completeness, one state has to be defined as the complement of the union of the other two. If you can remember that phrase, you're most of the way there in the definition of how to use this in a model. State transitions have to consider both directions of state change. So in this example of three states, we have six state transitions, state one to three and back and so forth. Um, you can derive that you have a total of nine antecedents given three states, six transitions. And for the general condition of n states, the uh, general expression is given by here. And that's a way to check whether your requirements analysis really has covered all the possible states and state transitions in your system. Given those definitions, it's pretty easy to see that there's some categories you can stick your antecedents into. Those are the under what conditions. You, you can say they're either state conditions, which is while a certain condition is true, do the following behavior, or it's a state transition kind of condition, which is upon a change from one state to another state, do the following. And of these, really only the state transition has to have the time requirement that says, within so much time of making a state transition, do a certain behavior, accomplish a certain behavior. Because the state requirement is, while this is true, continuously do a certain function. And the state transition requirement is actually incomplete without the timing element associated with it. And for those of you who have been involved in system engineering activity, would recognize that Brian Marr has done a lot of work in defining what really makes up a good requirement or a good system requirements analysis. And the adding the uh, antecedent condition as an explicit element of the requirements analysis basically adds another item to this function requirement architecture or answer test methodology because we break out the conditions explicitly under which the requirement is intended to be performed. And if you've taken Phil Leedy's class on requirements analysis in a cabin management system, you'll recognize under what conditions being associated with the what and the how well to constitute good requirements. Okay, I'm going to go through an example in some detail to make sure you understand. And this is a very simple example. I don't pretend that it shows everything that one might run into, but it shows the key features of the analysis. Let's say we have a power distribution unit, I call it a PDU. Its purpose is to provide highly regulated DC power. I'm going to define three states, normal operation, an off, power off condition, and what I'll call degraded operation. That's my anomaly condition. So since I have three states, I need to analyze nine antecedents. So as I go through this, we can click them off one by one to make sure we've done our job. So we first look at the state requirements. Over here on the left, normal operation. 
while state requirement, input power is valid, and I have to define what that means. In this case, it means input power and environments are within their specified ranges. Okay. A very explicit definition of what the condition is under which the requirement is to be performed. Provide at least 15 watts, et cetera, into a 15 ohm load. Okay. So that's the first state, normal operation. Now I'm going to move to the degraded power state. While input power is degraded, and again, I have to define what it is I mean by that, so that there's no ambiguity about that condition. Input power regulation doesn't exceed 50% of normal, and my environments don't exceed 20% of extremes. Then I have a slightly different performance requirement that I'm going to ease up on both the maximum power requirement and the regulation level. Finally, the third state is defined as the complement of the union of these two states. And so we get into English Boolean algebra here. While input power is neither degraded nor valid, here's valid, here's degraded, then do this function, inhibit all output. Okay? So that's the definition of off, is in terms of these other two states. And that way I cover all the possible conditions that the system may experience as inputs. Okay, state transitions. You'll see some of the same words, except now we've added the state condition, the state transition condition, so I need a timing requirement within 10 milliseconds of receiving valid input power. And that means I can come either from an off condition or I can come from a degraded power condition because it just says within 10 milliseconds of having arrived at normal power. So here I've merged two state transitions into a single requirement by clever use of English. Okay, now when I go to degraded, I'm going to have a different behavior defined based on whether I came from a normal condition or I come from an off condition. And that's our choice how we want to deal with that. We might think of degraded power as a condition that we want to operate in, for example, in a life safety situation where we want to operate, if at all possible. Somebody's on a heart-lung machine, so forth like that. We really want to keep operating as long as the system can keep operating. The downside is one has to define for the downstream equipment that's going to be receiving this degraded output the capability to perform in that environment. Often, when we get into degraded conditions, we choose not to operate. We say, if it's not going to be nominal, I don't want to operate, and we can choose to change the behavior. But on a transition from normal power to degraded power, Within 10 milliseconds of valid input power becoming degraded, I've defined, it, defined my state transition and the timing requirement, then I provide output power per the definition of the degraded power state. However, if I'm coming from an off condition, where I started off, we're going to say maintain a power off condition. There's no point in attempting to operate in a degraded power mode if I was already off to start with. And finally, transition to the off state from either normal power or from degraded power. And then five milliseconds of input power becoming neither complement, degraded, nor valid union of the other two state, state conditions inhibit all output power. And so our state condition is, again, the complement of the union of the other two sets. And you can do this for n states. Three or more, this always applies, the complement of the union. When it's two, obviously, it's just the complement. Everybody with me? Okay, software formal methods. I really don't know exactly what our, where we're at at that in the Boeing company. I did a little research on this. Um, Software formal methods, application of mathematics to software engineering. Typically, we do our software development in the mode of we, we do a design and then we have peer reviews to see whether that's a good design, satisfies the requirements, and so forth. Formal methods take a little bit more mathematical approach 
which means you need to be able to ab abstract the language into something that's testable in a more rigorous fashion. And the attempt in software formal methods is to at least augment and in fact replace the idea of peer review with a rigorous mathematical test of the software design. What that drives you to, unfortunately, is a formal specification language where you can couch your requirements in terms of elements of the language that can be manipulated syntactically by a tool or by hand, but nevertheless rigorously verify to the point of going more than, more than simply a code review, looking at complements, looking at or conditions. And to do that, you need to break out the antecedents explicitly to say exactly what is the condition under which this function is to be performed and what is the relationship of that condition with other functions that have been defined. So if you define a complement of a certain condition, one should be able to find the identical text somewhere else in the specification. And that's what you're trying to get to with a formal specification language. And I would refer you to this paper from last year's in COSI Proceedings. It has an example of that, something they're working on at Hughes Air in Canada. Um, what this does for you, however, it facilitates automation. Because now, having written the formal specification language, one can ask the uh, tool that you developed to go through and check, do I have universal sets on associated functions where I've defined one set of conditions as a complement of the other. You also need to use uh, standard terms so that you can figure out whether it's a state or a state transition because if it's a state condition, you don't expect to find a timing requirement. But, you would, but on a state transition, you would expect to find a timing requirement. Again, if we can standardize the language in something like a formal specification language, then we can develop a tool to do this automatically. And I think it e would ease the uh, pain and agony we go through in trying to verify that our requirements are correct. And having done that, we can link these antecedents in the requirements database so we can check their complements. And when we're all done, we can say, yes, we know that we've covered all the conditions. So these last three are, are things that can come out of being able to do the automation what the tool could actually provide. In lieu of that, having defined our um, antecedents very carefully, one can go through by hand and say, yes, I see this antecedent, where is its complement? And that's still a very useful capability. And um, as I said, here's a couple references if you're interested in pursuing that. Obviously, when you get this far, you'd like to be able to check, gee, does the system behave the way I want it to, even before I get it fielded? And that's where the issue of simulation comes in. You'd like to be able to make a simulation model and be able to plug in any conditions in the universe and be able to predict ahead of time, I know what the output's going to be, and then check it and say, ah, that output is what I expected. And having defined the antecedents and their complements, for all possible behaviors, you can have confidence that the system will actually behave the way you expect it to. So you want to verify the functional behavior is correct, and that for any of the anomalies you insert, you do get the behavior you expect. In other words, there are no surprises. And this is both in the simulation area as well as when you get into system test. You should not be able to come up with conditions that you had not predefined in the requirements analysis. Because if you do, that says your requirements analysis wasn't complete. Okay, summary. The set theory model provides what I think is a very simple method to treat anomalies. It helps you define them and gives you aid in prescribing the behaviors. Treatment of the complete set of requirement antecedents does ensure that the behavior of the system is fully deterministic. You know what the system is going to do under any possible set of conditions. And that's very important when we're dealing with very complex systems, and especially systems that impact safety. 
airplanes are an example. We really want to know what the airplane is doing at all times. The method can be applied in any system requirements analyst, by any system requirements analyst at whatever level of analysis you're doing. I began using this technique when we were about three layers down in the detailed design area and cabin management system. We were writing requirements in terms of messages and contents and so forth. And I decided to begin using this. And so in the latest uh, software requirements documents, or the last set that we produced, we began seeing the, this kind of language, neither this or nor that, and so forth. I'm not sure the software people appreciated what I was, what I was doing to them, but uh, that's where we ended up. Um, the benefits of doing this analysis this way is that at any level of description, whether you do it at the mission analysis, the system requirements, or even at the detailed design level, when you write the requirements that way, you know that the requirements are complete in terms of the behavior of the system you're defining. You can measure the completeness by asking, are all the antecedents defined? And the way to check that is, do you have complements? The other virtue of this is that when you get to the test phase, you have confidence that you've already defined all of the possible conditions that might be tested. In fact, you may think of some in the way you break out the details of the complementary antecedent that the, even the tester would not have thought about but you can have confidence that the tester is not going to come up with any new conditions that had not been previously thought about. I think if, if you get into formal specification language, you can actually automate this and use it for both verifying the system requirements analysis and the performance simulation. And the other thing about this technique is it supports the failure mode effects analysis by upfront documenting the system behaviors to different what-if conditions. And next week at the second seminar, we'll be getting into this a lot more. Um, the next seminar is entitled Designing for Failure, Anomaly Identification and Treatment in System Requirements Analysis. And that'll be a, a week from today, the same place. And we'll get into the complement of this one, whereas this is a test for completeness at the end, a necessary condition, we'll be getting into sufficiency conditions for ensuring the completeness of the requirements analysis in terms of what-if conditions. So that's a presentation for today. I'd be happy to entertain questions. Do you, are you aware of any software organization that uses your mathematical model for testing the software. I'm and not we do peer reviews here, but I am not aware. You know, certainly in the design area, the the block con construction of if, else if, else if, else is inherently this model. In other words, when we write software to cover all possible conditions, if there's an else statement in the in the construction, then by definition you have implemented this model. Unfortunately, we don't do that the same, we don't do that the same way in the requirements analysis. And that's where we end up with holes where software design comes up with conditions that we hadn't thought about. But no, I am not familiar with organizations actually doing using this kind of technique. There was a question over here. Uh, there was a formula you showed earlier, uh, summation of the I believe it's added number of tests in the form. Can you show that again? Sure. Okay, you asked about the, yeah, <coughs> yes, the expression there. Yes. So you're going to have a transition of 
gosh knows how many end states as you make that transition. How do you deal with something like that? If it's important, the question is, let me see if I can restate the question. Um, if you have a situation where you're going through many, many intermediate states to get to a final state, That's right. how do you manage the requirements analysis through so many states? That's right. Because N, N may be a hundred. It might be. Uh, if you if you choose, I guess if you choose to dis define your system states that way. Now it may be that you don't choose to define those as system states, and you say the only thing I'm going to recognize is going from off to on, and the prescribed manner for going from off to on. But in that transition period, no other behaviors are allowed except going from off to on. Formally. If you've defined 100 states, then by golly, you've got to define all the interactions of those 100 states. But it's obviously physically impossible to, if let's say I've broken up that from state 1 to state 100, you physically cannot go from state 2 to state 99. Okay, so that those most of those become invalid transitions. But if you're going to define those states with those unique antecedents, and that's the key, if, if it truly is a unique antecedent, then you have to define a consequence. Because if you don't, then the system behavior is, well, I don't know what to do under this condition because he didn't tell me. So if we truly need to define that many states, then we truly need to define that many behaviors to go along with those states and those state transitions. Did I answer your question? It's a challenging okay. question. <laughs> uh, yes, and you know, with software, if it can happen, it probably will. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have software control, search protection, where you're incrementing something, ding, 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 you know, you could have a single point anomaly, which was going to be a transition from one state, which is not sequential. Mm -hmm. um, and it has to be dealt with on the anomalous anomaly condition kind of situation. So it looks to me like under that kind of a severe condition, and would be 100. So yeah, it becomes a real problem. But yes. it does give you a theoretical approach. To this gives it. you a technique for being able to handle it. And you may say, well, the only thing I need to worry about is was the preceding state n minus 1. And if it was, then I have a valid behavior. If it's not, then I have always define where to go from that. And that's something to deal with in the design. And as I said, one can use this technique not just for system requirements analysis, but at the design level to make sure you're actually covering all the conditions that the system may experience. And your system, in this case, may be one box with software in it. And you're dealing with that, that set of interfaces. That's a good question. Are there other questions? Sir? Yeah, let's say I just got a kind of an outline of some requirements for the customer. Mm -hmm. And so then I did this kind of analysis where I, I figured out every possible state and I, I put requirements. Would it still be readable? Like I could take it back to the customer and, and show it to him and he'd be able to understand it? Or does it become kind of filled with a lot of verbiage that it would be hard to read? I think the customer, because they're not used to seeing requirements written this way, might be surprised, but if he can read a, a sentence that says, when such and such is neither this nor that, I think it's eminently readable. That's what we are doing right now on the phased array antenna program. Our requirements are being written this way. And I haven't had complaints that it's unreadable. I have had comments like, I've never seen requirements written this way but it hasn't been said that, that they're unreadable. I think they would be surprised. The other thing that your customer would find out was that you had identified conditions that the customer cared about that they failed to define the behavior they wanted. When you drive out the requirements by, by applying this analysis, you will, you will postulate behaviors in the absence of any input from the customer, and they go back and say, well, here's what we decided to do with this, and they may say, yeah, I like that, I like that, ooh, I don't want that. Oh, what would you like? 
because that one wasn't defined in their requirements to you. So it's a way of validating your customer's requirements to you to say, okay, I've got this condition and here's the not condition. Does he like that behavior that I've defined for the not condition? He may or may not, but at least you've had the opportunity to feed back your analysis of his requirements in a way that um, helps support his understanding of and getting the uh, system he wants to buy. I'd be happy to show you some examples of uh, the requirements we've written for the phased array antenna program that use this kind of language and you can decide for yourself. Are there other questions, sir? There's a figure five in your paper and if you have just the same one this gentleman asked about the formula for. And it shows A is the normal operation, B and C is specific cases of non-normal operation. Yes. And B is the case where that handles anything else. Is that this this figure right here? That's good enough. Okay. Right. Um, it seems to me that the biggest difficulty I've had in the past is I can define A and I can define I define B and C and then I give a general case, okay if Neither of those cases, none of those three cases are happening. Do this. Mm -hmm. That would be D. That would be D. Yes. And then someone comes up with a specific mm -hmm. case that's not A, not B, not C, and is a subset of D. Right. That has an action that I overlooked. I really do want a specific <coughs> thing to occur. How does this method uh, handle that? Well, this paper didn't, and um, what I was going to tell you next week was that your question was the number one question on this paper was, I understand the technique, how do I drive out B, C, D up in, ad infinitum? And next week's paper, I have a technique for that. So I'm going to ask you to come back next week, and I'll give you the answer. I'll have to ask you to he, give me your paper this week, right? He charges for next that's, week. <laughs> And, and that's fine. I'd be happy to give you a written copy of the paper. I don't have the, the view for yeah. finished, but I do have a, the written paper. And uh, I want to save that because I want you all to come back. Okay. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yes. In a related note, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons we often use a spiral model isn't because we, we've overlooked things. It often seems to be because the customer doesn't really know what they really want. Yep. Uh, how easy is it, do you think, from your, you know, it would seem like minor experience, when they realize, oh my lord, uh, we don't, what we really thought was A, B, and C is really Q, F, D, P, and P. E. Uh, and D is a little different than that. Uh, how do you, perhaps this is a prediction thing rather than experience thing, how do you think this technique is going to work in that case? Well, there's two, I'd say there's two parts to answer that question. The first is, at least having gone through A and not A, you can define for the customer, well you didn't tell me about not A and here's what we're going to do. And he may or may not say, well, there's actually some B's, B's and C's that I want you to worry about explicitly. Fine, we'll take care of that. Next week's paper, I'm going to give you a technique that I will assert gives you a sufficient condition for completeness in that you will be able to present to the customer after the first level of requirements analysis a complete description of all possible conditions in the universe in detail and be able to prescribe behaviors for those and hand those back to the customer and say, are you happy with this system behavior model? Because this is what we're going to go build. And it is complete in terms of defining explicitly the B's and the C's, as well as satisfying the completeness test of this paper. So the key, I believe, is getting that feedback to the customer as soon as possible not when we're in test and integration, and he says, oh my gosh, I don't like it doing that. It's when we're doing requirements analysis, 
and the cu you feed that back to the customer and they can say, oh gosh, I don't like it doing that. Now, that doesn't preclude the customer from changing his or her mind between the requirements definition phase and the test and integration phase. That's still going to happen, but it's not because we didn't have a definition of the behavior of the system, then it becomes because we changed what we wanted for the behavior of the system. In other words, we already had the antecedent defined, but we're choosing to alter the consequence. Did I answer your question? Not quite. You're getting closer. I mean, we're getting a lot more wonderful information. Okay. It seems that the customer changes their mind about yes. what the system is as they, as we say, go into a you know preliminary test or something like that, or, or we're chatting with them and saying, "Well, we've analyzed this, and we, you know, this is what it's going to do." And they say, oh, oh uh, well, we learned something. You know, uh, fire systems have told us, well, we can't ever let this happen. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to change this, 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 this. And we see this all the time. So I guess part of the question would be then, you know, you no longer have A, B, and C, and you have P, Q, and X, and, and Z, and D gets smaller, and, you know, if you I mean, get there's, there's major there's major you know a lot of the systems that I know yeah you know, it's not ever uh, have, things have changed as they've learned that you know you often hear oh is that what we asked for well that's not what we want <laughs> yes now, right. I understand that and any time you change you change the A's and you change the system requirements you have to go back through this activity again and say what what gets modified. And this doesn't protect you from that. Right. Yeah. This, this says, I can get a complete description of the system behavior based on the requirements I've been handed. And I guess I'm asserting that the sooner you feed back the prescribed system behavior to the customer in a complete fashion, the more likely it is you will early on get agreement or um, I don't like that kind of response. And that certainly doesn't preclude a new person coming in who wants something different, or when they finally understand it a year later, what it is you're going to do, they say they don't like it. Those are human kinds of things, and, and this model can't address, doesn't really address that explicitly. It does, does say, well, if you get a change in requirements, you need to go back through this process and see if anything else changed. And you're right, you may end up with P's and Q's and R's and all that, and I guess you just have to go back through this process. Well, I guess I was wondering, from your experience, has it made it easier to do that? Or is it, no, it just is a nice way of explicitly showing what it is that the customer's asked for? I don't know that we've had enough experience with feedback to the customer that they appreciate what it is we're able to do now, and I don't think we were able to provide the feedback on CMS soon enough with this kind of a, a model so that they could either agree or disagree with the prescribed behavior. Because we had many, many cases where we thought we understood the requirement very well, and in fact we'd implemented according to what we'd understood, and they may even have agreed with, yes, that's correct, and, and yet later they learned something, like you said, they learned something and they have to change it. And you know, that's life. Our, our, our tools, our methods have to be able to accommodate change. I kind of respond to that. Um, I'm familiar with some similar types of tools where they have led themselves to formal specification methods. And I see cases where having a formal specification method allows you to uh, simulate the construction model early. And you can't take it back to the customer, demonstrate it um, graphically. I have talked with uh, some tool vendors last summer when I was at the uh, meeting in St. Louis where I presented this paper about these ideas. 
and they all nodded up and down. So, oh yeah, we could do that. Um, yeah, everybody's smiling. You're used to tool vendors. I haven't seen anything that explicitly captures this level of association where you actually ask your database, your tool, to link, logically link these in a set theory fashion. I agree with you that it should be fairly straightforward, but you have to, you have to do two things. You have to have first the formal specification language where you explicitly break out and use in a consistent manner the words and you're very careful about just defining your requirements. And the second thing is you provide those links. And I haven't seen anything, but I have not researched it real carefully either. This is a technique that you don't need a tool for. Okay, that was my, my reason for doing this. You don't have to have a computer to do this. You can do this with any implementation of requirements. Paper and pencil is fine because we're, we're pretty smart people. We know how to see if uh, B and C and D actually makes not A. And, and it doesn't require a computer to do this. Certainly the computer can help automate it and make it go faster, but it's, it's not a requirement. Okay, I think I'm gonna break it off here because we, we said 45 minutes and I uh, wanna let you go back to your normal jobs if you have questions. Um, I'm up on the fourth floor by, uh, I think it's Q8 now, and I'd be happy to to discuss further with you, and you ask for a copy of the paper for next week if you talk to me afterward. Thank you very much.